You've been requesting that I talk about how I store my files for quite some time now, and I've mostly been avoiding that topic because my previous file management strategy was not something I'd recommend to others as it was pretty careless and convoluted. So today I'm going to show you the new scheme I came up with and provide many reviews for some of the stuff I tried implementing along the way. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody, I'm Gerald Undone, and I didn't choose the Purple Life, the Purple Life chose me. So I'm not going to be able to finish this video today because I still have another NAS unit to try out, but that won't matter too much to you because by the time you're watching this, I would have already tested that other NAS unit and included it in this very video. But that's future Gerald's problem, and he'll have his time in the sun in a few minutes, but let me, past Gerald, tell you what I've learned so far. So my old way of doing things was to record my footage to SSDs and then connect them to my editing rig via USB adapters and edit right off the drives. But for multi-camera shoots, this would require me to have several dirty danglers hanging down every orifice of my computer. In terms of performance, this actually worked fine, although there was the odd time where I'd get USB conflicts and I'd have to remove and replug in the drive, but mostly no big deal. The real issue was a lack of redundancy and the fact that these drives were out of commission until the edit was done. I couldn't transfer over all the footage because my internal drive wasn't big enough to contain the multiple terabytes of data contained on all the USB drives, and it's generally not good practice to completely fill up your system drive if you plan to use it for operations. Actually, it's just not good practice in general to completely fill an SSD. But what's worse is that if one of these drives failed during the edit process, that footage would be lost forever. Now I know that some people are already gasping at this because they archive their footage. I do not. I'm not a keeper of past unprocessed footage unless it's something really special. But considering that I record a few terabytes of my silly face yammering on every week, I'm not really interested in storing all that nerd talk perpetually. So I just keep the final exported videos. And I'm okay with that, and that's not going to change. But what is going to change is building in some redundancy for the footage I'm using before the video is finished so that my work can't be lost mid-project. That's goal number one. The other limitation to my current configuration is that co-working on a project requires the passing back and forth of those dangling drives, which is just not efficient. So goal number two is to make the project shareable over my studio's network. Finally, for the stuff I do keep, like finished videos, thumbnails, personal files, etc., I want to revamp my persistent storage. Right now, they're stored on a mechanical drive in my computer, then backed up to this old D320 share center, which actually required custom third-party firmware just to keep using it, since it has serious security flaws in its original state that the latest updates of Windows 10 rightfully prevent you from accessing. But after that, I send those files off to OneDrive for a cloud backup. Now, I like OneDrive, and I get the storage I have for free as part of my Microsoft suite, but I'm limited to one terabyte per user, and you can only add an additional one terabyte maximum at $10 per month, which isn't a great price. So I've been using Backblaze B2 for the last few weeks as a test to replace my OneDrive. So far, I've really been liking it. You only get charged for what you store, which is at a rate of half a cent per gigabyte, so $5 per terabyte, plus some transaction fees if you download a lot. But if all you do is store your files, you can bank on pretty close to $5 per terabyte calculated daily. So if your storage increases dramatically for a few days, you only pay extra for those days. This video isn't sponsored by Backblaze, but I've been finding it pretty perfect for what I need. And when I compared it to similar services from Amazon and Microsoft, Backblaze turned out to be much cheaper. For example, to back up and store my personal files and all my finished videos for the month of May only cost me $2.95. And the per day calculations will be great if I want to also back up my project files mid-edit because then they'll have a third location for redundancy and I'll only pay for the days I use since, as I already said, I don't keep my footage forever. So that brings me to the last thing I'll need from the NAS that's going to fit this job. I'll need it to support backups to Backblaze B2 so that I can just store everything on there in a redundant RAID array and then have the NAS send it off to Backblaze on a schedule automatically. And since this NAS is going to be used as a replacement for my direct attached SSDs, I want it to be as fast as my SSDs, which means a few more requirements. I'm going to be setting up 10 gig Ethernet and I'm going to be making it a compact array of only 2.5 inch SATA SSDs. For the 10 gig network cards for my computers, I went with the Aquantia 107s. I was able to get their Action 10G gaming cards for $125 Canadian, which is under 100 US dollars. They installed fine and Windows 10 recognized them and installed the latest drivers automatically. I calculated my total storage needs to be about 4 to 5 terabytes. The most I ever need for my video editing projects is about 3 terabytes, and I need about 1 terabyte for personal files and finished videos. So I decided to go with 6 2 terabyte drives in a RAID 10 array, I chose RAID 10 over RAID 5 or 6 so that I could better saturate the read and write speeds of two computers simultaneously accessing 10 gig connections, and RAID 10 is also simpler and generally more successful and easier rebuilding if I lost the drive. And RAID 10 would still leave me with 6 terabytes, which should be plenty for my needs. I ended up getting crucial MX500 drives because there was a good deal on them at the time, and their 2 terabyte version provides a decent lifespan of about 700 terabytes written. Now, typically speaking for this purpose, you would want to go with enterprise drives 
drives or SSDs specifically designed for NAS, but they're priced much, much higher, and I was getting such a good deal on the MX500s where even the Samsung Evos, which do offer a better TBW, were almost double the price. So I was in a position where economically it was better to buy more spare drives than it was to buy longer lasting ones. But if you're planning on doing this yourself, look for the most TBW you can get for the money and buy quality drives. I figure 700 terabytes written should be fine for my usage, since I'll probably only cycle 10 to 15 terabytes per month, so I should be able to get at least four years of constant use out of these. Now I just needed somewhere to stick them, so I reached out to the players that I knew in this space, Synology and QNAP, to send me a NAS fitting the bill. And here's what they sent. Synology sent their DS1618+, Plus, and QNAP sent their TVS672 XT. These are both 6-bay boxes that accept 3.5-inch or 2.5-inch drives, but the QNAP also has slots for two NVMe drives, so 8 drives total, but the Synology can be expanded in that way with PCI Express. However, I needed to use the PCI Express slot in the Synology to install their dual port 10 gig network card so that I could connect the two computers that I need to have cooperative video editing capabilities. Now this QNAP already has one 10 gig port built in and then two Thunderbolt ports. Now for me this wasn't ideal, which is why Future Gerald will have to come in and take over when I get the replacement unit for this device, because I'm going to be swapping this box out for their TVS 882ST3, which not only has two 10 gig ports built in, but it's also smaller because it's 2.5 inch form factor only, meaning it can take eight SSDs in an overall smaller package. But in the meantime, I had a chance to compare these two units for my needs, and here are my findings. Overall, the QNAP is the better unit, but it's also quite a bit more expensive. The Synology offers a pretty compelling value though, at less than half the price. But there's a couple things to consider. As I mentioned earlier, if you need two 10 gig ports, then you'll have to get Synology's expansion card, which at $269 will take this $750 NAS and make it $1019, only $580 less than the QNAP. But if you're on a computer that can't use Thunderbolt like me, then you'll also need to get a Thunderbolt 10G adapter for the QNAP if you need two 10 gig ports, which will cost you $184, bringing the more comparable prices to $1783 for the QNAP and $1019 for the Synology, without drives of course. The QNAP has more RAM, 8GB versus the 4GB on the Synology, but I didn't find this had a major impact on my use case. Perhaps if you need to run more complex operations on the device, this might be important, but for my simple storage, video editing, and cloud backup, I never even used the 4GB on the Synology. And I even tried upgrading the RAM to a dual channel 16GB kit from Crucial, and I saw absolutely no performance difference in the UI or in transfer speeds. So I wouldn't recommend upgrading the RAM if you're using the Synology in the way that I am, but I can recommend that particular RAM kit if you need to upgrade it as the kit worked perfectly fine for me and the install was a breeze. But jumping back to those transfer speeds, the QNAP did outperform the Synology in my disk speed tests, but that must be dependent on the CPU and not the RAM. The QNAP is using a 3.1 GHz quad-core Intel i3-8100T, where the Synology has a 2.1 GHz quad-core Intel Atom C3538. The large sequential reads were similar, which is all that some people might care about, but I figured since I had a bunch of SSDs to test, I might as well RAID 0 them and see which device is faster when everything else is the same. I also found the QNAP to be more stable and more consistent with the tests. Each time I tested the Synology, I got different sequential writes and drastically different random reads and writes, but the QNAP was steady and consistently three to four times faster in the randoms, as well as about 10% better in the sequential writes most of the time. The same was true for RAID 5 and RAID 10 configurations, and I tested the Synology using the EXT4 file system to match the QNAP and used very similar settings. Now speaking of rating SSDs, I also found the Synology was much more picky about which drives in which configurations would allow for trim to be activated. I could only activate trim on the Synology in RAID 10, where I could do it in pretty much every combination I tried on the QNAP. Since I wanted RAID 10 anyway, this isn't that big of a problem, but it's something you should consider if you're a RAID 5 or 6 user and you plan to use SSDs and you want to use trim commands. I do prefer the Synology's UI though. I find it cleaner, more modern looking, and a bit more intuitive to use. And the Synology also boots up, shuts down, and restarts much faster than the QNAP. We're talking 20 seconds versus two to three minutes. This isn't a big deal once you get it up and running, but those minutes did add up during the initial setup. The QNAP's UI is quite similar in many ways, but I found I was constantly being bombarded with notifications and pop-ups, and it was just generally a little more difficult to navigate during my first use. The QNAP is also noticeably bigger and heavier than the Synology, but it is a bit quieter. That's something I forgot to mention that I wanted to fix about my previous setup. 
the noise. This little D-Link box creates way too much noise, even when idle. I often have to unplug it to shoot my videos, which is something I'd like to avoid in the future. I tested the idle volume of all three of these boxes in their permanent home, and here's what I got. With everything turned off in the studio, the room measures 33.2 dBA. Then I turned on the D-Link 320, and it jumped to 42.7 dBA, measured from about 3 feet or 1 meter away. And it's also higher pitch noise, so it's easier to hear over the noise floor of the room, and my mics pick it up really well. The Synology was a lot quieter at 39.2 dBA, and the pitch was lower as well, which helped. And I'd say you can safely record in a room with this running as long as you're not right beside it. Give yourself about 6 feet or 2 meters and you should be fine. The QNAP though was the quietest at 37.6 dBA and it had the lowest frequency, which is the easiest to clean up and the hardest to hear amongst the room tone. That test by the way was done with all the devices set to their respective quiet modes. Now like I said, I'll be updating you in a moment when I get the new QNAP to test, but to summarize what I've learned so far, both of these devices were able to do exactly what I needed them to do once I installed the required 10 gigabyte cards and adapters. I could transfer my footage onto them, have two computers editing off of them, and have them backed up to Backblaze B2 on a schedule. And with a 6 drive RAID 10 array of SSDs, I was able to easily saturate two 10 gig connections. I tested simultaneous file transfers on both computers, and both of these NASs could handle the throughput. Timeline performance was about the same on both, which is very snappy and indistinguishable from editing off of my internal SSD, and they both both exported my videos in exactly the same amount of time. And they both allow for a drive to fail and prompt for it to be replaced. I have a couple of cold spares here of the SSDs, and I tested a drive swap to rebuild the RAID and both succeeded. So again, they both accomplished my goal. But the QNAP was faster. It rebuilt faster, it has faster random reads and writes, and is more stable during the file transfers. The Synology would hit the same max speed and would hover around the same extended transfer rate, but would fluctuate a lot more than the QNAP. And although I like the UI better on the Synology, the QNAP appears to receive updates more frequently during the short time I've had them, and it gave me fewer issues that required a system reboot, where I had a couple disconnects and hangs on the Synology. I also like that the QNAP has an easy access port on the front to allow me to quickly offload my footage, and this device also features 10 gig USB ports including Type-C, where the Synology only has USB Type-A and only 5 gig, and the QNAP is slightly quieter which is important to me. The QNAP also provides a little bit more in the box, including CAT6A cables for the 10 gig connections alongside the CAT5E cables for the 1 gig, where the Synology only comes with the 1 gig Ethernet cables. So QNAP does save you a little bit of money there. Now, none of these differences are huge, but the experience is overall smoother on the QNAP. But at several hundred dollars more, it might be hard to convince you that those somewhat nuanced improvements are worth it. I'd say both are good choices if you're planning to do something similar to me, and if you're looking for the best value, the Synology is probably your pick. But if you'd rather get the most you can get for your money, regardless of the price, I think the QNAP is the winner. Now if you've got even more money to spend, let's take a look at the TVS 882ST3 and see how it stacks up, because on paper, that unit seems like the ultimate version of what I'm looking for. But QNAP won't let me borrow that unit until I give them this one back, so I'm gonna go do that now. Give me about 15 minutes. Okay, so it's about six weeks later, and I've had an opportunity to use each unit for a while and edit a couple videos with each of them, and I'd like to update you on my thoughts. But first, I'd like to thank Storyblocks for hooking me up with that hang glider. Luckily for me, this isn't Far Cry, and I don't have to take a hang glider places to pick up packages. They just come in the mail. But that's not as exciting or as entertaining as stock footage. And when I need stock footage, Storyblocks is my go-to solution with their impressive collection of clips covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K video. They're also amply supplied with backgrounds, overlays, and After Effects templates, and the interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty-free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. All right, so the workflow has been great and everything worked out as planned. The cloud backup to Backblaze worked extremely well with each unit, and I'm really happy with Backblaze B2. My last two monthly bills have only been around $5 each. The Quantia network cards haven't given me any problems and everything's been really stable. And six weeks later, I'd say my previous conclusions still hold up. Now, comparing this new unit from QNAP, the TVS 882ST3, this is the upgraded version with the i7-6700HQ and 16GB 
gigabytes of RAM, and it costs around $2,800, which is quite expensive for a box of its size. And as good as it is for what I'm doing, that price definitely gives me some mixed feelings. First of all, to the positive, it does have two 10 gig RJ45 ports, which solves the problem that I had with the other QNAP, and it still keeps the two Thunderbolt 3 ports as well. Now, I assume that this level of connectivity and using the Intel X550T2 definitely contributed to the cost increase, but for what I'm doing, I'd be happy if there was a cheaper version of this without the Thunderbolt card. It also has two 1 gig RJ45s, two USB 5 gig Type A ports, and two more USB 10 gig ports, one Type A on the back and one Type C quick copy on the front. So connectivity is great. But a quick note about the dual 10 gig NIC. The one that they installed on here has a very noisy fan. I was disappointed when I first started using this NAS because it was supposed to be the smallest and quietest of the bunch, but it was actually louder than the other two. But all that noise was being generated from the tiny fan on the network card because the rest of the box was very quiet. So I unplugged that fan and the sound level dropped to the same level as my room, so that is exactly what I was looking for, a silent NAS. I did some stress testing to see if unplugging that fan would cause instability or network throttling, and it doesn't seem to. The hottest it got was around the 50s to low 60s Celsius, which I think should probably be fine for that component, and the speeds never dipped. Just keep in mind that I'm not officially endorsing this action and it probably violates your warranty with QNAP. Now, the build quality of the 882 is fantastic. Solid metal construction. I especially like the SSD trays. They're obviously a lot smaller because they're only for 2.5 inch drives, but they're very rigid, made of metal, and have very strong, satisfying locks and releases. Lastly, this unit is loaded with media features as well, including an HDMI port and a remote control, so you could use it as your media PC at the same time to make your money go further. I have no intention on doing this, so for me, those are wasted features that probably could have been removed to save some money, but they're there if you can leverage them. Now, as far as actual performance goes, it's not as simple as the more expensive unit is the best. First of all, real-world performance felt pretty much identical to the 672 from QNAP, with the same reliability I complimented in the first part of this video. But the benchmarks showed mixed results comparatively. Against the Synology, the QNAP 882 shows nothing but improvement, with noticeable gains in the random reads and writes. But against the cheaper QNAP 672, the multi-threaded random performance was nearly cut in half. Now, I'm not really sure what to attribute this to other than the CPU. It would appear that the i3-8100T that's in the 672 is better suited for those types of tasks. The sequential reads are best on the 882, but they're close enough that you can't really tell the difference in the real world. And that's fair to say about the Synology as well when it comes to video editing. The biggest disappointment though is that I still wasn't able to fully saturate the 10 gig connection with sequential writes while using RAID 10. I can only achieve it with RAID 0, and adding more drives from 6 to 8 seems to only incur more of a penalty, dropping the write speed from 1000 megabytes per second on 6 drives to 970 megabytes per second with 8 drives. It's possible the controller or the way the RAID 10 is handled in the software is just incapable of hitting that 1200 megabyte per second that my connection can handle for the write speed, but this is a limitation that you can't solve by just throwing more money at the problem, because each of the three devices I tested at very different price points have this issue. So if fully saturating 10 gig reads and writes on two computers is your goal, you might have to look at a custom solution, because I don't think boxes like these will do it. Let me know if you'd be interested in a follow-up video down the road building out a custom solution and comparing price to performance against these types of boxes. But all that being said, based on my purpose, the write speeds I'm getting are perfectly fine for any of these and are generally faster than the media I'm dumping onto the NAS anyway. So the bottleneck is usually USB or my reader or the card, and they're all plenty fast for video editing read speeds. But then that brings us back to the pricing. The Synology is still the best value of the lot, and if we don't count media features and Thunderbolt ports, because I'm not using them anyway, all that I'm getting by throwing more money at the problem is quieter operation, more reliability, steadier transfers, and trim support. And in the case of the TVS882, higher capacity since it's an 8 bay option instead of 6. I really do love the silent operation and more efficient size of the 882, but I can't help but think the 672 is probably a better use of money, considering it even benchmarked better, and it's quiet enough. And after using the Synology for nearly a month, I can also say that I don't really have any big problems with it either, other than the fact that it is a bit noisier and has a few more limitations and quirks regarding loading SSDs in there. So overall, I'm pleasantly surprised. Normally when I compare products, I expect to find one of them severely lacking, especially when there's a $2,000 price disparity between the cheapest and the most expensive unit. But I'd be okay with recommending any of these units for my use case, and it really just comes down to your budget and the amount of refinement you want to pay for in your hardware.
But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure to leave it the old thumbs up and consider subbing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. All right. I'm done. <laughs>